congratulations to everybody who's managed to join us that you've passed your first test, which was that you set your clocks back. Uh, and it's great to see everybody. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the chief executive of the Association of Jewish Refugees. And it's a great pleasure to be partnering once more with uh, Insiders Outsiders uh, Festival, as we have done for the last uh, 18 months or so, uh, marking a collection of fantastic, uh, stimulating events that have proved uh, fascinating and illuminating, and including today. Uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to be part of uh, this special event. Uh, on a subject that is uh, connected with the work of the AJR, where we advise uh, people on a whole range of Holocaust era compensation and restitution issues, nothing uh, along the lines of this particular story that we're going to be hearing this afternoon. Uh, but in general, there are a whole range of reparation, restitution, compensation schemes that the AJR uh, assists and advises on. And I just wanted to take this opportunity that in, um, uh, in the pandemic that we're all facing, the, the thrust of the work of the AJR uh, is of course the provision of social welfare services to Holocaust survivors and refugees. So if you are aware of anybody who could benefit from the unique services, and I, and I would say that, the unique services that the AJR offers, then please do get in touch with us uh, at this very important stage. Uh, it's also a part of our work to promote the culture, the heritage, uh, the history, the traditions and culture of the, uh, the refugee and survivor communities that came to Britain and to shed light on some of the connected stories, some of which are only now emerging even at this very late point, uh, 75 years after the end of the war. One of which of course is the long-standing issues of restitutions, not just of the story we're going to hear about today, but of a whole range of assets that are still to be recovered. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over. The, the, is just, as I said in the introduction, everybody on the event uh, has been muted and you will be kept muted throughout the event. But we do uh, want you to encourage you to uh, ask questions and leave comments using the chat function that the, if you click the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to submit questions and uh, chat. Please direct them to my colleague, Monica, Monica Berndukhan, uh, who it's um, a pleasure to work with and to see again this afternoon. Uh, and then she will be uh, comparing and moderating the Q&A session, which will come towards the end of the event. The event is being recorded. Uh, we do ask that everybody who's on the event, it's, it's fantastic that you're here. It's even more fantastic if we can see your faces. If you don't want to be recorded, then you can turn your camera off, but our preference is that you keep it on. Uh, and then the, the video, the recording of this event will be available through both the Insiders, Outsiders uh, website's YouTube channel and the AJR's YouTube channel in, in a couple of days. Uh, I think those are the main things to add. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to hand over now uh, to Sue Grayson Ford, who's delighted to meet, to say hello to. And she's going to be in conversation, uh, making a presentation with uh, Rene Gampel, who it's also nice to meet on this call. Uh, and as I said, please direct questions uh, to Monica uh, on the chat function below. And I hope the event goes smoothly. I'm sure it will. We're looking forward to a fascinating and stimulating conversation. Sue, over to you. Okay. Hello and good afternoon. This is the story of one of the most distinguished European art collecting and art dealing dynasties. Rene Gampel is the fourth generation to run the family firm and his son, Lucas the fifth. Their family story has everything in extreme measure, romance, bravery, patriotism, suffering, tragedy, but also miraculous survival against the odds. And all that came before the recent hard fought case against the French government to reclaim a small but highly symbolic part of their family's art collection. It was a real David versus Goliath battle. But no, I won't give away the ending. That's Rene's prerogative. 
And I became aware of this amazing history while researching Brave New Visions for the 2019 Insiders Outsiders Festival. The exhibition celebrated a remarkable group of men and women who, after fleeing Nazi Europe, transformed the London art scene. Among the exhibition's heroes were René's father, Charles, birth name Ernest, and his uncle Peter, and his mother, Kay. They opened Gampel Feasts in London in 1946, and the gallery's name was in honor of their father, who died in Neuen Gamma concentration camp just days before the camp was liberated. And this is going to be a story in three parts tonight. The history of the family, the war years, and finally the evidence presented in the Gampel family's restitution case. So Rene, over to you. Uh, the Gampel family has its origins in Alsace, where in the 18th century, as far back as we've been able to trace, we were farmers and eventually in the 19th century moved into the towns, into towns there. Ernest Gampel remained working in Alsace until the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. When the Germans won that war, they annexed Alsace and Ernest decided to move to Paris at the same time, another Alsatian family, the Wildensteins, with whom we had intermarried in the 19th century, took the decision to move to Paris. Ernest was worked in the stock market in Paris, La Bourse, as it was called, and Nathan Wildenstein began to get involved in paintings and uh, period furniture and talked Ernest into getting involved as well. Uh, and suggested to Ernest that he open his own gallery. Nathan had a gallery in Paris and Ernest opened this, his first gallery, which would have been in the last decade of the 19th century. As you can see, it, dealt, it, it has English spoken. That was an important aspect. Ernest, we don't know why, spoke English sufficiently for Nathan to work with him on clients who were English speaking clients because Nathan didn't speak English. Probably they were love matches, but they were very advantageous alliances, weren't they? They were indeed, yes, yes. So there is Ernest, uh, looking a bit dandyish. Uh, Trouville, uh, advertising his Paris gallery, hoping to catch the summer crowds coming to the Normandy coast from Paris. Uh, he's obviously cycles around, he's very flat there. And uh, so his business must have been doing reasonably well if he had a summer place as well as a, as the, as a Parisian gallery. At this, this point, uh, Ernest and Nathan decided to open jointly in New York, which they did. This is uh, their first, first joint venture from 1905, uh, where they felt they could capture the new American market of industrialists and other nouveau riches who were interested in acquiring European culture. So that's where they opened up. Then they moved on to ever grander premises. This one in the First World War uh, is, we, we, we presume from the poster on there, so 1917, 1918. And the partnership between Ernest Gampel and then his son René continued with the Wildensteins until the early 20s and then there was an amicable separation and Wildensteins continued on their own. Uh, Gampels continued on their own in Paris and in New York as well. Ernest met Adèle Vuitton, who was Louis Vuitton's niece, and in fact she had been part of the family's luggage good for goods firms, as I call it at the time, in which it was a preeminent firm for luggage goods because people were traveling more and more. And she had worked in the Anier factory with her uncle and other members of the family. Um, she had also worked for the Couturier Vert, uh, W-R-T-H. She met and fell in love with Ernest, so much so that she converted to Judaism. I mention this because the Vuittons were a very Catholic family from the Vosges in central France, and the Gampels were decidedly a Jewish family. 
for Adele to convert at the time of the Dreyfus affair was quite remarkable. And it might have created some tension between our family and the Vuittons as we gather from certain correspondence. But eventually it was reconciliation. It was accepted. Just as uh, Ernest was a single child, so they, Adele and Ernest had one child named René. And as he grew up, he became part of the, his parents' business, his father's business. Always kept close relationship with his mother, who, who they had wrote regularly to each other when he was away. It was a close-knit family. René, in turn, met and married Florence Trevine, the youngest sister in a, of 14 children in a British dynasty, art dealing dynasty, originally a Dutch family in the 19th century that had come over to Hull and then migrated to London. And Florence's father, Sir Joseph Juveen, and her brother, Lord Juveen, uh, were both great patrons of the arts. Uh, you will know of the Javine Galleries at the Tate, which is where the Central Sculpture, Tate Britain, the Central Sculpture Hall, and the Elgin Marbles in the British Museum, which, by the way, uh, the money given for that, uh, it was a condition attached that Javine's own restorers would restore the marbles before they went on display to the enormous chagrin of the British Museum's own restoration department, but they were overruled. So uh, Javin sent in his boys with their wire brushes and they removed any last faint remains, remains of uh, paint and patina from those sculptures. And so that's the way they are today. Um, Javin was a notoriously successful and notoriously tricky art dealer. René Gampel was very wary of his brother-in-law. Javine was highly rec recognized everywhere. I mentioned the Tate and I mentioned the British Museum. This is Boulevard Lord Javine in Marseille, um, a city which will return in the story, but it's still, we don't know why Marseille honored him. Perhaps he made some donation of some works of art to a museum there. At any rate, they, they are, uh, the relationship was a professional one between René and between his brother-in-law, and then there was this family link, uh, which was also a valuable link in many ways to have. So, um, now we have now, your grandmother and grandfather. That's right. This is in Jacques Doucet's Hôtel Particulier, or mansion in Paris, which they rented for a number of years. And Doucet was the great late 19th, early 20th century collector. He was also a top uh, modiste, a designer of fashion, uh, much admired by the, by the Gampels. And so here is René in a military looking uniform, although he was invalided out of service in the First World War with his spouse, Florence, and they lived a very grand life for the throughout the 20s. Uh, this is the sitting room with the Dorans uh, on the many visits that René made to New, to New York, the East Coast, and to the Midwest to do business. Florence would accompany him, sometimes bringing over one of the three sons he would eventually have, accompanied by Nanny or Governess, who both would be put into second class while they were in first class on board a ship. All the proprieties were kept, in other words, comme il se doit for the period. So they, they, the business was a great success, and uh, René kept a diary of all his meetings with various people. Uh, he organized exhibitions. His special was 18th century French, but he organized exhibitions as he was interested in le moderne, as he called them, the contemporaries. Uh, and this is one example of it. Your grandfather also had aspirations to be a Broadway um, playwright. And when they were on their amazing jet setting via um, luxury liner uh, trips to the States. Apparently one of his favorite hobbies was to write plays. 
I found that fascinating that he had time for so many cultural activities, but it was typical of the time. People were invited for amateur soirees, sometimes given at the universities, sometimes given by people in private theatres, and you wrote short plays, mostly comedies or light, and, and we have some of the plays that he wrote. Incredibly, I've read them, they're amusing, uh, sub Noah Coward, I should say sub sub Noah Coward. And they, they, he, uh, there is a, one or two letters from him when he's writing to people saying, I do hope a producer in Broadway notices my play. He did have aspirations. I don't know where you found that information, but he did have that. Uh, aspiration to become a playwright as well as you say I don't know where he'd have time but he anyway that's what they did it was a popular pastime in a certain milieu at the period and this is a remarkable flyer for an exhibition in his gallery uh, both at New York and Paris where if you just look at the designers of the carpets uh, we have Man Ray, we have Miro, we have uh, Leger absolutely remarkable so though his passion was for the old masters. He's, he was very, very supportive and interested in the new masters as well, wasn't he? He was, he was indeed, yes, he was. And here are some of the new masters. Yes, he, uh, especially in the first uh, 20, 25 years of the century, the 20th century, he would accompany other people or go on his own and buy works from the Impressionists. So this is a letter from Renoir that after Renoir had been out there to the studio and then Renoir sketching, doing a little sketch of the work that, that Renoir had seen and asking him if he's still interested in it. Um, Renoir does write a fair length in a diary he kept about these visits too. So that one's to Renoir and there were other visits. This one to Monet. Uh, they're, they're quite humorously recorded. In this one, he accompanied the French dealer, the great French dealer, Bernheim Jeune, uh, uh, another dynasty which is still going. And at the time, they more or less represented money. And they went out by train and then by bicycle to get there uh, to, the, to visit money at uh, Giverny uh, and spent the day there and had quite a lot of long conversation, which again, Rene records in, in his diary. In 1909, in Cabourg, in Normandy, the bachelor René Gamper meets the bachelor Marcel Proust, and the two of them are slight outsiders. They, they're staying in the same hotel. It's a hotel which is now thrives on the fact that Swan spent many holidays there and there is a swan room and i think it has a premium if you want to stay in it i can understand for the acolytes anyway they they it, they got on well and it's probably because there were two outsiders who would sit in the evening and until late at night commenting on the guests as they came and went uh passing remarks about them uh when he made the observation that the strange author was even though it was summer, was always huddled up in a coat and always seemed to be cold, uh, but he delighted in his company. As a result of that meeting, they remained in contact. And uh, when uh, Post won the Prix Goncourt, René went to uh, a jeweler, a top jeweler in Paris, and uh, arranged to have a type in, a, a diamond encrusted type in, sent to Post. As, as a token of admiration. So they continued to correspond. Proust did visit him in Paris, and we know from uh, Florence that he visited, but he, all, he wouldn't accept any invitation to the wonderful dinners, so she claimed, that she gave for their friends and their clients. Proust would always call after midnight and keep her husband up till the wee hours or till the morning in their library chit-chatting, probably gossiping about the, the demi-monde in Paris. And uh, Florence, as a well-brought-up young Englishwoman, did not approve of a man visiting after midnight, and so she never met Proust. Uh, that, was, that was the way she saw things. But this friendship did 
this is it's not a, it's not a close friendship, but the warmth comes out in the letters that we have from Puss. We don't have the letters that he sent to Puss, but I expect they're available somewhere. So, this is the the writing so, on the wall. The writing on the wall. So the Europe was in a crisis, the late 30s, with war approaching. Uh, the Munich Agreement, nobody trusted it. Uh, by 38, René had closed his exhibition space. He kept a gallery, but he no longer mounted exhibitions in Paris. And he tended to deal more from his home. After the Germans invaded Paris, very quickly, in his case and in France's cases, they had the case. They had to leave. They headed south. In the René, we now know mostly by bicycle, sleeping in the fields. Uh, he headed all the way down to Marseille, stopping on the way at one or two towns. Meanwhile, his apartment was requisitioned by the Germans. This is a inventory of the furniture and other items in his apartment drawn up with René's housekeeper and secretary, Odile Ferrer, who comes back into the story later. And this document survived. So their apartment is taken over in Paris. His business is closed down. His gallery goods are seized. René, of course, is on the auto abets list of people not allowed to carry on in business because they are Jews. Uh, as time goes on, but very quickly, he's no longer allowed to keep a bank account and no longer allowed to do business uh, and no longer allowed to call himself an art dealer and, of course, becomes a legal non-person. But meanwhile, they're down in Marseille and everything is chaotic in Marseille. In that first month after the armistice, which was signed on the 22nd of June by Marshal Pitta on behalf of the new Vichy government and divided France into two. So the Germans occupy the north and the Vichy government is, is in charge of the south. And the Vichy government at this point hasn't quite fallen under the boot of the Nazis and is still struggling to identify its role, even though in London on the 18th of June, de Gaulle has made his clarion call over the BBC airwaves, asking the French not to accept this armistice, but to continue fighting. In Marseille, everybody who's trying to escape France has moved down there. There isn't a hotel room available. People are sleeping in bathrooms. And there's an incredible American called Varian Fry, a journalist, a reporter there, who manages to get passes from the, from the Americans, which he hands out like confetti, although he's not supposed to. And he arranges for the cream of a certain French intellectual milieu to escape on a, on a boat going to anywhere as it happens to America. So we have Hannah Arendt, we have Marcel Duchamp, we have, uh, we have uh, Chagall, we have uh, Arthur Kessler, um, we have any number of, um, uh, we have uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, the anthropologist, uh, any number of people fleeing and leaving. Why did the Gampels not do that? Florence is a British citizen. She could easily have got passage. She has a brother in MI6, and MI6 is already active down on the coast. René Gampel has a business in London. They could have asked for passage. They, they decide, no, they will stay and fight. And together, they set up the very first resistance network in Marseille called Azur Transport. Uh, they are joined by Ernest, uh, René's eldest son, and by Jean, the youngest son. The middle son is in uniform up in the Pas de Calais, and when the British Expeditionary Force leaves France in the famous Dunkirk evacuation, all French soldiers in uniform who want to leave at the same time are taken away. So Peter arrives in England 
and he very quickly decides to join the British Army. You had the jo choice of joining the British Army or your own national unit of the incipient resistance. He joins the British Army and Peter eventually becomes an officer in a remarkable unit called Phantom that operated often behind the lines. And he saw action on the front line with Montgomery at El Alamein and later at Monte Cassino in Italy and followed the army in Phantom all the way up into Austria where they took the Austrian surrender in 1945. So that it was his war was in uniform with the army. For Ernest and for Jean, for René and for Florence, it was the resistance. Ernest is eventually captured. He's imprisoned in the force, fortress Fort Saint-Nicolas in the harbor of Marseille, from which he manages to escape because the prison chaplain provides a set of keys and René escapes from there, knocking out a guard in the process, disappears for a while to Chamonix, eventually makes his way back and with the help of MI6 and probably M M19 or M M M19, who helped uh, Allied allies escape, escape organized escape routes. He makes his way through Spain to Portugal and he's taken out by Royal Navy submarine to the UK. Now at the same time, there's a Canadian who has been in um, France and gets out not at Dunkirk, Dunkirk, but very close with the British Embassy as they too flee Paris. Now Kay is a Canadian from Winnipeg. She had won a scholarship after being at the University of Manitoba. She'd gone to France to study history. The scholarship doesn't pay very well. She manages to get a landed job in the British Embassy. So of course, when they close down, when the Germans occupy Paris, she's able to get a ride out with them to the coast and across to, to England. So uh, this person is going to come into the story, so I'm just setting it up. Meanwhile, René has now moved in with the help of money from MI6 and SOE. He has moved in to set up a far more important network work called Gloria, which has been set up by Janine Picabia, the, the daughter of the French surrealist painter. And this network is an intelligent network which operates for two years until it is penetrated and uh, betrayed, as it happens by a Belgian priest, and the, the Janine manages to escape, makes her way to London and joins SOE, Special Operations Executive. Uh, one of the people who just manages to escape and who'd been active in that network is the Irish author uh, Samuel Beckett, and he goes to ground in Provence in a small village where he can't be found. Uh, so that network is wound up. Uh, now René and Florence are on the south coast where a lot of French Jews had moved because the south coast comes under the control of Mussolini and Mussolini who wanted to reclaim what he called the kingdom of Savoy all the way, almost all the way up to Toulouse, all the way along all the great towns. He wanted it for Italy, Hitler agreed to that. One thing Mussolini did not agree was to the roundup and deportation of Jews. It's not that he wasn't anti-Semitic, fascism and anti-Semitism are, uh, it's almost an oxymoron, it goes together, but he wasn't interested in this particular issue. So Jews found a relative safety, especially in Monte Carlo, until the overthrow of uh, Mussolini in July 1943, when the Germans sweep in and round up every Jew they can lay their hands on. The Germans are now organized. The, the famous various departments that have come to seize goods in France, eventually uh, 70 or 80 train loads of goods, they've come now and they are systematically going through uh, public and private collections and, of course, seizing collections from that belong to Jews or enemy aliens. There are some wealthy Brits who had been living on the, on, in the Côte d'Azur who had to leave and their goods were taken as well because, of course, Britain was an enemy alien, an enemy country. So Schoenu, which is a great transporter and a storage of art, has written to Rene to say, unfortunately, the German authorities under the rules of, of the, the rules in place have broken into the crates we've been storing from you. They bought two lorries and eight men and they are going to remove everything and there's nothing we can do about it. And that's, uh, so he is watching items disappearing here and there. 
he has got to make a living somehow. He's got to keep working as much as he can. There's no source of income, there's no bank account, and he is also now under suspicion for being in the resistance. So uh, things are getting precarious for him. Uh, Shuni isn't the only one. There is, a, we'll see later, Hobino is another firm, and they come into the story as well. Huni is arrested and imprisoned for five months and released in uh, only in January 1943, I think. He's arrested for five months for anti Vichy activities. He's imprisoned in Fren, and from Fren, he writes letters and postcards. Uh, the postcards will eventually become important evidence in our trial. This letter goes to Florence, to his wife, and he writes about his daily life there, about the people he meets. He organizes lessons in English, and he teaches some of the prisoners English to keep their morale up. And his morale appears to be reasonably good. He complains about the food, but from time to time, food can be delivered from the outside. This is not, after all, anything other than a a military prison. It's not run by the Germans at this point. It's run by Vichy. Now we get to meet your mother. The little Canadian, Kaymour, is in the UK. And of course, every young person there is expected to do something. And she gravitates via the Fannies and becomes uh, an officer at SOE because she's a fluent French speaker. She is Canadian, but she's not French Canadian. Her father was an Irish immigrant to Canada and married a Canadian there, but she speaks absolutely perfect French. And she is soon to be, I expect, a very good organizer. And she rises quickly in the ranks at SOE headquarters in Dorset Square at the top of Baker Street in the Alliance Francaise, where a, a number of the agents she handles, for instance, are Jean Moulin as well, who passed through there when before being parachuted back into France on behalf of de Gaulle to unify everybody. And Jean Moulin uh, is an interesting uh, character because he, of course, he's in the art, he becomes in the art world as a cover and then for real too. The art world plays a good role at this point. Meanwhile, uh, Ernest is in, under interrogation, first by MI5 to ensure that he's not a German plant. And later, before he's, taken in by SOE, he's interrogated again, where they uh, point out that he's arrogant but can be trusted. And he will join the gullist forces in London that are known as the BCRA, and that's de Gaulle's SOE, if you want. De Gaulle has one problem, he cannot get his agents to France unless he uses SOE. SOE control everything. They have the pilots, they have the planes, they have the money, they have the weapons, they have the force papers, they have the ex explosives, they have everything that is needed to send agents, commandos, liaison people into the field. And Kay becomes a liaison officer for a whole group of French who are going to be parachuted over the months to come into France. René, I think by now they're in love with one another, aren't they? Against all the rules and against um, the wisdom of the times. The recommendation of the time, you're quite right, Sue. Do not fall in love with an airman who is going to be sent on a bombing raid to Germany. Do not fall in love with an agent. The attrition rate amongst the air, air crew from flak and being shot out of the sky is tremendous. The attrition rate in SOE is even worse. But she does fall in love with him. And this yeah. is his this is the passenger list showing that he was parachuted into the Lyon region on the night of the 25th, 26th of November That's 1943. She must have signed that with an absolute breaking heart. Yes, she would have signed it with a breaking heart. And this list, this list was given to me not long ago by the Nigel Atkins, the son of the pilot, who was an SOE pilot for various missions all over Europe. And when I looked at that list, I was particularly struck. And it's, just, it's, it's, there's a, there is a, an airline service, shall we call it that, between France and the UK, in which people are being taken in, all of them in code names here, but people are being taken out as well. And as you can see, there's a Delattre de Tassigny who, along with Leclerc, is this, are the, 
was one of the two most important fighting generals under de Gaulle. They would lead in the field where de Gaulle was politically maneuvering everything behind. So he's being brought out to England as all the and others are being brought out, but mostly it's agents being dropped in France to carry out a mission, eventually, hopefully, to be brought back out again to report and then back in and so on. However, after six weeks in the field with Andre Boulos, who's another, another of the people that uh, Ernest is captured, betrayed, because so much of the war is betrayal, betrayed, captured with Boulos, uh, badly tortured. Boulos is injured. Uh, Ernest is badly tortured. Uh, then, but he, but he doesn't reveal anything. Uh, and he, they are then sent to Auschwitz, uh, Buchenwald, and they end up in Flossenburg, where in April 45, the advancing allies rescue these two men amongst others who are really on, on uh, barely alive, but they are alive. Um, uh, this is Kay. So Kay's... This is... Go ahead, Sue. Sorry, this is, I, I just, I find the story so amazing at all points, but here's Kay insisting that she must be flown to Paris to work with fellow Canadians, which is of course a cover in her case for knowing that she must search out her fiance, um, Ernest, and, and his father, René, which sadly she isn't able to do, but she is successful in finding Ernest, isn't she? Yes, that's right. There was a whole unit in Paris, uh, and in, very interesting, the SOE and a lot of other Allied units there had taken over the Hotel Lutece, Lutece which had been, also had, been the, had been one of the Gestapo headquarters during the war, so it switched sides, the hotel, no choice either way, requisition by first one force and the other. So the war, the war, the war gets hold of everybody at that time. Everybody is involved in a wartime situation. And uh, René is on the run. Uh, once the Germans consolidate their hold on the, on the Riviera and the Côte d'Azur, there is no way that it's they're safe there. Florence has to be, there has to be a, some safe place for her. And Jean Gamper, who is the younger son and who would be part of the Maquis, the countryside resistance, and he was an expert in explosive blowing up factories working for the Germans, he emerges from the shadows to arrange for his mother to be uh, hidden deep in the French countryside by a French family who will protect her at their own peril. And she knows not to open her mouth and obviously in surroundings where the villagers must have said, we don't know what's going on. We prefer not to know going on. There's going to be no denunciations here because there were also periods when there were no denunciations, especially late in the war when the French were fed up with Pétain for all sorts of reasons. René has moved quite a lot to the Charol area, which is a big, parachute drop area uh, for the SOE, for MI6, for the American OSS, who now involved in dropping for their own agents. And he is up there, we know, but we don't have all the details yet, working with yet another network. And then he's trying to do some business and he is betrayed by a Parisian art dealer to the Gestapo and they trace him capture him and he's imprisoned first in the uh, Montluc prison in the Lyon, in Lyon, where Klaus Barbie had tortured Jean Moulin to death. And then he is transferred to Compiègne in north, in north of Paris. And there six weeks before the liberation of Paris, but already the allies are sweeping across France. The Germans with that grinding uh, oppressive machinery are still sending convoys to the camps and he is sent out there. He manages to drop a, a small note that he's pricked out in, in the words with a pin on a sheet of paper, put in a small envelope and addressed to his nephew Serge Le Monnier in Paris. And that note, which I only discovered recently, 
was found, was delivered to Serge, in which he says, I'm being taken to Germany. And that note, uh, it turns out, is in the Imperial War Museum in London. I shall have to go and look at it one day. So uh, he's taken to Neuengam. Neuengam is a slave labor camp. There are quite a lot of French political prisoners there and other political prisoners. And he has worked to death. It's a, it's a slave labor camp. It's not an extermination camp, but the vast majority of those working there die uh, from, from exhaustion and cold. And he dies in January. Uh, 1945. Um, I've seen his death certificate there. And um, yes, so, so he doesn't make it through. He reunited at the end of the war, uh, back in this in Walton Street, where Kay had been living with two other young women who were also involved in SOE, the three of them had shared this flat in Walton Street, around the corner from Beecham Place, Beecham being another name that uh, Ernest had used as a code name, the Circle, Gendarme, Beecham, Beauchamp, Beecham, and the two of them are engaged to be married. Denis Carr has now been introduced to Jean Gambel, and Denis, again the link to Kay and SOE, she is an exceptionally brave resistance fighter in Brittany, in a network in Brittany, and she had fought throughout the war and fallen under control of SOE, who brought her out in a Lysander, the famous plane, still a few of them around, that could land in a muddy field and take off in a muddy field, even though some of the passengers had to lie uh, on the, at the foot of the fuselage of the pilot's feet. And she's taken out and taken to the UK before going back into France on a mission now under SOE control. But she gets introduced to Jean Gambel, the youngest member of the family, uh, who is, uh, he, there he is, in a very dramatic pose. He, he had a, an explosive war, as he put it, one day. He really was an action person, and uh, it, everything was about attack, attack, attack. And he meets uh, and marries Catherine. All of them are decorated, both by uh, British and French governments with all sorts of decorations. We have this uh, wonderful wedding between a Winnipeg girl who is actually a commander uh, and was Ernest's commander. So uh, extraordinary, uh, nice bit of local reporting in the Winnipeg free press of their wedding. So one happy, yes. one happy event in 91. One happy event, yes, one it was a big, event. that's right, a big, a one happy event, that's true. And Winnipeg must have seemed very far from the war. Uh, <laughs> one can see from the ads around there. Um, Ernest is given the highest wartime award that de Gaulle can give. It's his own personal award, it's called uh, Compagnon de l'Ordre de la Libération. He initiates it in 1942 and he closes it in 1946. And it's given to 1,038 men and women, mostly men, as befits the time, unfortunately. Uh, and Ernest is a recipient of this award. There is a, a permanent museum at the Invalides to the Ordre de la Libération, with events on the whole time. Um, I have to say, as a descendant, I get invited to certain official events in France, uh, though I have done no war. I mention this about Ernest, and the reason for mentioning it is that some time after receiving this distinction, he is summoned to appear before a tribunal in Marseille, where he is to answer charges for having knocked out a guard when escaping from the Fort Saint-Nicolas in 1941. <laughs> Some things are not forgotten. Some things are not forgotten. Did he actually appear before the court on that? He, he didn't. He, he, <laughs> he, was, he was deeply hurt by this and he didn't appear. And it, it may, he never gave up his French nationality, uh, but he may, it may have soured his view and I should just mention that in 1960, after de Gaulle had come back to power as president in the Fifth Republic, 1958, 
although Ernest disapproved of a general becoming president, he didn't believe in military people becoming civilian heads of state for whatever reason. The crisis, the Algerian crisis, was such, as we all know, that there was a threatened putsch against the French government in Paris by disaffected French troops in Algiers at the OIS, Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, and other diehard colonialists who did not want to give up French Algeria. And one morning, 1960, my father comes down to breakfast. I'm all of 13, I think. My brother's uh, 11. And he announces to the family that if there's an attempted putsch against the French government, he will don his uniform again and he will go back and fight alongside de Gaulle. That's a uniform I understand is now in the Imperial War Museum along with other uh, wartime accessories and documents. Extraordinary. Yeah. And now we've, we've fast forwarded to 1946. Well, not that fast forward. And your parents and your uncle, uh, Peter, have opened Gampel Fils in honor of René, their father. And yes. they are faithful to the French, um, French artists, but very, very quickly become the place to see contemporary British art, which is um, how I knew them without knowing any of this background because they were very modest and certainly didn't talk about it to, uh, to, to their visitors, to the gallery at least. And we're now in the last part of the story, which um, concerns the three Durand paintings and the court case. So I'm going to show you these three wonderful paintings. And you can tell by the captions where they are or were situated. So this story of this story, which involves seven years of legal discussion, but actually 10 years of research. And like so many of these stories, it, in, it, it involves a great number of people. And it's an international story. Uh, so let me just mention two key French art historians Margot Dumas, who investigated the length and breadth of the archives in France, uh, assisted by Denise Verneret Laplace, herself a distinguished art historian and specialist on Franco-German uh, art history periods before, during, and after the war. Then there's Emmanuel Pollack, who is, uh, Dr. Pollack has been appointed by the French government to investigate items held in the Louvre that may belong to uh, families that were stripped of their possessions during the war. And she has obtained this position through her hard work. And also through a book she wrote, uh, it was published a year and a half ago, called The French Art Market During the War, or the, market, the Art Market During the War. And it was a she accompanied it with a remarkable exhibition at the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris uh, about the history of various art dealing families during the war with a lot, a lot of documentation. So they were involved there. Over in the UK, we had Ian Locke and Kerry Mile Locke, who did incredibly detailed work amongst the 10,000 family documents to build a narrative and timeline of René's movements. It was important to show where he was at any one time in France, so much so that that imprisonment in Fresnes, we didn't know the date of his release. And my cousin Claire in Paris, who's just a lead member of this team, you could say, she gets involved by writing to the French president and saying, please just give us a date of release because the papers will have all been sealed and we obtain that. So these people have all been involved and then from Canberra in Australia, uh, Diana Costirco and from Baltimore, uh, Lily Bowers have also provided information from time to time. And there's one or two other people have on the periphery have come in and disappeared, come back again. This is a huge teamwork to build up a case. The two items that Sue has just put up here are part of the key evidence. 
when René was write, writing from Fresnes to Florence, he was especially writing to Odile Ferrer, who was looking after his, her, his affairs in Paris as best as possible. And these are two almost duplicate postcards sent one after another because they contain an instruction in code, not a crude code, but enough for her to understand, and presumably the censor didn't, saying, please take care of my good friend, Andre Durand, you know how valuable he is to me, i.e. I wish you to make a sale of one of the Durands. He, he will do it again for Greuze, and he will do it for Chardin. He'll talk about a little boy in blue that should be shown to his nephew, Serge Monnier, who remained in Paris because Serge knows somebody who, who would like to, to meet this little boy. And another time she, he mentions an art dealer who would like to buy a quantity, several meters of canvas, as though he were wholesale and raw canvas. She understood what this is and she worked wonderfully for the family to help out. These documents disappeared after the war. We, we didn't know about them. And they resurfaced when the, after long after Odile's death, the family handed over a box they discovered of all the correspondence she, she kept. And these we presented in court because in the high court in the first trial, the charge against us by the lawyers of representing the French state in the Museum of Marseille was, why did René Gampel never issue an invoice of any kind if he was supposed to have been selling these Dorans? And our answer was, it was self-evident, if you are not a legal person, if you have no right to do business, you do not write out an invoice to anybody, you do not name the person who's buying from you since you're not supposed to do any sales, you do not name a price since you're not supposed to be earning any money, so you, can, you can't issue an invoice. But in fact, these are invoices. This is the wartime invoice of an imprisoned Jew resistance fighter trying to make a living as best he can from whatever he can lay hold of of his possessions. This is what an invoice looks like. This is um, a pre-war list uh, listing the Dorans brought from the Kahnweiler. Daniel Kahnweiler is a hero of mine amongst art dealers, a German art dealer in Paris whose entire collection was confiscated by the French in the First World War and sold off afterwards. Uh, he was Jewish, Kahnweiler. Kahnweiler then re-established himself, one of Picasso's great art dealers. He re-established himself in Paris until 1940 when the Germans arrived and once again confiscated his entire collection. So first time because he was German, the second time because he was a Jew. Canvila survived the war and he re-established his business after the war and set it up again. I think that's another remarkable story for another time. Um, so there, there are the, the Dorans. He actually buys six Dorans. And during the war, he's dealing, amongst others, with Gallery Chalessin. Uh, he's dealing with this, which is a front for... André Moulin. André Moulin has been told by MI6, uh, because of his interest in the fine arts, to set up galleries. He has at least two galleries as a cover story. And it's also important to have a gallery because you can move money in and out of a gallery on the basis of sales, real or fictitious. So this gallery exists and there is that the, René does some business with it. Art business, perhaps, other business perhaps, because money is being moved around for the various networks as well. Uh, he, he's, he's doing business with a few people. There are also, I should be mentioned, a number of dealers who have a very bad reputation during and after the war because they, and we know some of them too, they are doing business with the Nazis, but they're not above, the Nazis are not above stopping them from buying things from Jews in France, en cachette, hidden or discreetly, as long as the Nazis profit from the resale. So there are all these 
combine, as the French say, combinations of arrangements going on. And it's, the question is, it's too late in many ways to tease out what was done for the Allied cause, what was done against the Allied cause, what was done for oneself, what was done for the, per the other person involved. But the story will slowly be pieced together. One of the two surviving compagnons de la libération, Daniel Cordier, where Jean Moulin's secretary has written several volumes of his memoirs, became a great French art dealer after the war. He's donated a lot of his collection. He's still alive. There are two compagnons who are still alive of the 1,038. I think he's 90 now and the other one is 100. It's wonderful that the art world appears in a good light and through Daniel Cordier and Jean Moulin and through René Guimper, let us be said, let it be said. That again, we have Odile Ferrer. She managed to extract a lot of the documents from the apartment in Paris after it had been seized. And also some of the furniture, uh, uh, having assured the German embassy official that René Gamper was neither an enemy alien nor a Jew. And uh, uh, before he found out any better, she managed to extract a lot from there. So a lot just survived. Uh, they, the Germans were not that interested in the archive of an individual. They were more interested in what they could make out of anything they could seize if the in individual was uh, somebody who was considered an enemy alien in any kind. So things did survive. And after the war, Jean Gamper managed to get most of the archive together. There are, there are gaps. It's not complete. Things have just disappeared. And after René's release from Fresnes, in early 1943, uh, he, in, he realizes that he must, he must now be careful and leave clues for his wife and his sons as to how he has arranged what remains of his property. So items that have been sold are clearly marked with the name of the buyer. Items that are his collection are clearly marked and items that have been sold under duress do not have the name of a buyer. And that's after a lot of work, the art historians and Ian Locke and Kerry Meyer Locke finally figured out the message he was trying to pass on. And he mentions in notes, I must leave with you, because he's now, he, life is getting dangerous. France's life is getting more and more dangerous for everybody. France is getting, is sinking into economic, uh, there's an economic crash, the Germans are getting more vicious, there's, there's less of everything, and he's trying to make provision just in case. And luckily the just in case provisions turned out to be the right ones to make. When Odile Ferrer extracts items from the apartment in Paris, she, she arranges to have them at René's request, deposited at a big storage firm called Robineau, so Robin Frère are, are storing furniture and works of art that Odile Ferrer has managed to move out into their care and they have agreed to store it and they get paid for storage, but then they send a notice to René that they too have had to release everything to the Germans because someone in their firm has denounced René Gamper to the Germans and said there is there are works of art belonging to a Jew stored at Robineau and the Germans move in very quickly uh, denunciation and they remove everything they remove crates 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 uh, which just disappear um, be because that's the nature of the time in France Some items are sold during the war. This is a post-war uh, analysis of what was sold from notes that were made in the, in the books that survived the war. This is uh, items that were sold, as far as we know. Uh, so we were able to, to distinguish between what was sold and what wasn't sold. You can see the Durans are there as well. We, did, we finally knew from his cryptic notes what was sold and what was not sold, and that was important to arrive at certain decisions on this case. There were no names ever given during the war. We presume they were sold because he, he would write return to owner, but not put the name. And that was his key to say sold. sold. But I right. can't mention that I sold it. That's right. Um, it items confiscated. Uh, 
we put in claims on some. Some things were recovered after the war, a handful of things. Uh, a, a lot of things were not recovered. Most will never be recovered. And that's the nature of this world. This is a record of both Ernest, your father, and your grandfather's wartime network of resistance. That's right. It was in order to um, try and work out exactly where Rene was from month to month. Because when we had to argue our case in France, in front of the court, we had to try and show the timeline of somebody in his condition when he might have been able to make a sale and when he might not have been able to make a sale. It, 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 we had to build up a picture of somebody needing to make a sale because you need to make, you need to make a living when you, there's no social security anywhere in France or barely any, and, and he can't continue in business. So he's doing it in, it's, you could say, a black market in, in, the, in, uh, in the trade, in, art, in the art trade. He's doing it. So we needed as much as possible to know where he was at any one time. So people, so that, so that our, the, the lawyers for the museums couldn't turn around and say, well, it's unlikely he could have been making a sale then because he was probably imprisoned or he was, he was doing something else. No, we, we know ex pretty well exactly, certainly up to very close to the second arrest, we know where he was. So that's what this is about. Uh, in, and, and he was obviously in contact with Ernest, his son, because there's this, I let you read that. Uh, to put this into context, he's writing to Rose Adler, who was a wonderful French artist and a great bookbinder. And she and Rene Gamper collected manuscripts and rare books and had a lot of them bound by Rose Adler. And he's writing to her. And he just again, just in case the message gets read by a censor, he talks of himself in the third person. He mentions a Belgian, but in fact, we think it's now it's a Swiss uh, who, who bought not far from a million francs in modern paintings. Uh, and then later, she comes back later with another million. And he's wondering whether he'll get a commission from this because art really was exchanging hands, probably not worth what is written there. But he says, isn't it wonderful? Because she fell from the sky, i.e. parachuted in and a friend of her son, of course, who was an SOE as well, therefore an Asian parachuting in with money. Money was needed for all the networks. You needed to bribe officials. You needed to pay for, for, for the creation of false documents, false cards. Uh, you needed to buy weapons uh, that were circulating in criminal circles. Uh, agents, money, uh, radio sets, um, dynamite, uh, guns, whatever, were all being parachuted in. And in this case, it's, as you say, it's a fairy tale. It's, it's barely disguised. He's excited. He's managed to transfer money. So it's been transferred to a network. Uh, uh, it's mostly MI6 who provided the money. And I came, I think, through SOE. It's been transferred to a network and he's very excited about it. And in, in addition, he's had a message or he knows because a message has been passed on that his son Ernest may have been involved in this. This was uh, pinned up on the wall there as it would have been pinned up on any uh, large business emporium, I would say under the German occupation, under such and such an, a law, the Jews are not allowed into the Hotel de Rouen under any circumstances. Now we have to assume that that was imposed on them. They, it's not a message, they, not, they would not have pinned it up, but they pinned it up. And as you say, they did a, they did a roaring trade during the war. Um, uh, quite a lot of this emerges from uh, Dr. Pollack's exhibition at the Memorial de la Shoah. Quite a few photos of the of the sales. In fact, it's the cover of her book, uh, Le Marché de l'Art sous l'Occupation, as the covers of her sale at Hotel de Roux. And I wanted this image to be shown because, okay, we know this occurred during the wartime, but it has there are unpleasant echoes still circulating around the whole issue of provenance and provenance research, and it surfaced from time to time, and incredibly surfaced uh, just over a year ago uh, in France uh, at an auction house 
where I was taking part in a conference on restitution. Emmanuel Pollack was there, Corinne Hershkovich was there. I forgot to mention a wonderful lawyer, Corinne Hershkovich, who represented us brilliantly here. And uh, Lawrence Eisenstein and Ellen Snyder from Washington, who've been helping the family right from the beginning. So I just mentioned them because I want to bring in the other players. As I said, it's an international team doing this. So Emmanuel, Ellen Snyder was at this conference in Paris. Um, various other people were there that, whom I recognized from being involved in the research. And when it was my turn to be on the platform with a couple of others, a hostile questioner actually challenged me and said, well, are the people working for you making money? And I think the room went silent because when we didn't know what this was about and I said these people are professionals they are highly gifted people they've done a lot of research they earn their living as people do who are art historians or provenance researchers by trying to do something to advance the cause of whatever situation it might be an exhibition or it might be restitution you you do your research and you get paid for doing your research these people are all un universitaire and hire doctors in several cases. Yes, we pay them for this. This is this is why it's an you, this is why it's an expensive quest without any sure 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 surety that you would win. So then an article came out the following week in the Gazette de l'Hôtel Rouen, which is published regularly each week, in which the uh, the reporter, in effect, from the title onwards, attacks the whole business of provenance. And given that the provenance so often, in the case of restitution, has to do with Jewish families, it is uh, not a comfortable, I, I'm not personally touched by it, but the context is wrong. You would think in 2019, as it was then, the context says, choose your language carefully, especially if you're writing for the Gazette de l'Hôtel Rouge, where I go a lot in Paris. You know, this is, nobody is working there who is alive at the time. So we can't possibly uh, charge the current directors, the auctioneers there with anything. It's not about that. It's about, um, a certain attitude that might be taken and that shouldn't be taken. There we are. So, And this is the wonderful exhibition at the Shoah Memorial in Paris, which I was lucky enough to see, which is the exhibition put on by Dr. Emmanuel Pollack, which indicated and numbers extraordinary numbers of the two million works that were stolen from national museums by the Nazis and from private collections and which were sold in these very auction houses in the capital, such as Drouot. I thought it was a suitcase, a traveling case, but it's, it's better than that, even better than that. Should go into production again. That, that chest of drawers, by the way, Sue, which has René Gamper's initials on, is a Vuitton chest of drawers. What he did is he asked Vuitton to make uh, crates, chest of drawers, crates of various size, uh, tra uh, travel crates, in which he could slot in smaller paintings. And they were taken on board his ship whenever he went to America. He'd, and, and Vuitton complied. They, they did a lot of things to order. And when they had an exhibition at the Petit Palais a few years ago, they also have some of his... I don't know how they acquired them, but they've got them. And they're quite big, some of them. And they've got these, it's, it's like a racks for paintings. And you could slide things in and out. And they were very forward-thinking firm, you could say, at the time. They didn't have a great war, but they were a forward-thinking firm. So does this one at least belong to you, René? <laughs> this one belongs to us, yes. Oh, good, good. This was a reprint, wasn't it? The diary of your grandfather came this out. This was a reprint and an updated version. It originally came out in 1963, uh, and then it was translated to English in 1965. Both versions are a print on China. 
and then the cousin, my cousin Claire, Jean Veltrichard, whom I mentioned, and myself, working with another French cousin, we we took over and we reworked the manuscript in 22 notebooks, 100 page notebooks, uh, so children's sized, classroom sized notebooks. And we, we co copied out the entire text again and realized that a lot had been omitted, many things had been changed, and there were a lot of errors. Actually, Diana Kosterko, the cultural historian from Canberra, from the National University there, who knew the knew the text inside out, helped us with a lot of corrections. And the it, we, we republished it, adding 200 pages to the 500 existing pages, now 700 pages long. It's substantially correct, except for a few boring travelogue passengers. The, he had a dispute, uh, he had a dispute, a legal dispute that went to court with Gabriele D'Annunzio over a manuscript which he purchased from Denuncio, Denuncio's last novel in the 30s. And uh, that's, we, we haven't completely reproduced the arguments in the book, but uh, someday maybe. But anyway, that's 700 pages is long enough for a diary. But he recounts very funny visits to Ford and to Rockefeller in America, and he comments on life around him and Paris gossip. And lots of entries on André Durin, whom he knew quite well. Lots of entries on Redon, on Forain, or on Post, and the Impressionists. And these are the disputed paintings. Well, no longer disputed, but how did it hear? Because we haven't been absolutely clear that you lost the first case and that it was only on appeal that you won. How did you feel you, when you were told that you'd lost the first case? You, you are quite right, Sue, and I, I should perhaps have mentioned that earlier. We were, of course, very disappointed that we lost, and the, the, the presiding judge who, who delivered judgment later, several months after the trial, which, which that trial was held in, in, in the High Court in Paris, um, he decided that the evidence we produced wasn't, wasn't good enough. It wasn't complete enough to show that these were the Durans in question that had been belonged to René Gamble and that he'd sold during the war. There, there was enough doubt that he couldn't, couldn't find in our favor. However, he felt that there were issues to be raised about this whole case, and he, he, he gave us leave to appeal. And after discussing it with our lawyers, we decided to appeal, and the appeal court found in our favor, which of course is wonderful. But more importantly, to, as I see it, the appeal court rested its judgment on two crucial indicators that are tilting French law now in favor of claims of restitution. The first is it made reference to a law that French government passed in April 1945, after France was liberated, before the end of the war. French government passed a law that said all, anything that had been seized or sold under duress from anyone who suffered during the war as an oppressed minority or an oppressed person would not be considered valid and that these should be restituted. That law has remained in abeyance in France until now. It's now been highlighted very importantly. The second is going back to the Washington Conference, uh, which was held in the last century, in the 20th, the late 20th century, in which countries, uh, what, seeing that statutes of limitations were beginning to appear because the war is now quite, quite old, as we know, a long, long time ago, We've just celebrated the 75th anniversary of the of, of, of the end of the war, whatever. So, statutory limitation apply. Uh, most Western countries, most countries that were implicated, including France, said we continue to allow the presentation of evidence, and we continue to allow that claims can go on being made. There's no cutoff date for the moment. The French court also said that the evidence we produce, and I refer you to the two postcards that, that René sent to Odile Ferrer saying, in effect, saying, sell the Durin. 
they recognized that this evidence was actually better evidence than that held by the two museums in, que in question, the Continu Museum in Marseille and the Trois Museum in, in the middle of France. Because those museums did not have an accurate provenance for the pre-war trajectory, trajectory of these paintings. Both museums acquired the paintings after the war. The case of Trois in 1951, from a, a big French collector, a Jewish collector called David Levy, an industrialist from the area, who made a, a wonderful donation to the museum. He knew André Dorin well, he owned a lot of Dorin's, and he gave Dorin's and other works to the museum, which was an important part of the collection. He acquired them in 1951. He didn't acquire them during the war, he was in hiding during the war. The other, if the Continue Museum acqu acquired them in the 80s, they, they purchased them. They weren't donated, they purchased them from a collector. The thing is that we kept pressing to find out what, where they had been during the war. And it turned out that all three paintings had appeared in wartime auctions. We had to do the research at great expense. Uh, Margot Dumas was chasing archives. We had to find out because the museums didn't want to do it or said they couldn't do it or couldn't afford to do it or didn't have the expertise. This is all going to change in France because now the provenance departments are becoming very important. And on the 23rd of November, the family is involved in setting up a research uh, fund for provenance students, students of provenance research and working with other French bodies were having a big meeting in Paris at Notre Dame University. And the French government is involved through various bodies that they have set up now to take the issue very seriously. There's a sale from 1942 of, a, of an important collection, of an Aryanized collection, which then had to go up for sale. And the director of the Louvre, wartime director of the Louvre, acquired 16 important paintings for the Louvre. Others went to the Quai d'Orsay and to the Museum in Troyes. Uh, Emmanuel Bollac is on the track to ensure that this, the investigation into the entire question is resolved, as, as will other people be doing. So this law suddenly tilts the balance in favor of those who feel they have a claim and have so far been brushed off. Remember in France, there's no deaccessioning. No national collection can ever dispose or sell of a single work. So had the French government said to the court, well, the Gampels, we find in favor of the Gampels, but at least in the case of two of these Dorins, they are national collections. We have to change the law. It will take years, but we will change the law on this. No, they said it doesn't fall under that. It falls under the 1945 law of stolen or forced sale goods. In other words, they never belong to the state in the first place. Therefore, it's easy to give them back to their family. Thank you so much, Rene. It is the most incredible story I've ever heard. Well, thank you very much, Sue, for, for guiding me on this and pulling me into back and forwards into the, to make sure I... I <laughs> told the story correctly thank you you told it more than correctly you told it brilliantly thank you so much and now it's thank over you. to monica for the questions that uh, will be put to you Rene. monica yes with great pleasure well of course i must start by adding my profound thanks especially to Rene, of course but also to sue for her commitment and enthusiasm and you know sort of hard work involved in preparing the presentation of course to the ajr as well. But without further ado, I think we should indeed proceed to the questions. I know that Michael Newman himself has already set the ball rolling uh, privately to me, but I'm going to just check what is um, uh, coming through from members of the audience. Um, right. Just give me a little minute to sort of just sort of, because they've been rather slow in coming. Um, keep them coming, by the way, everybody just type them in, uh, directed to me as um, you've been advised to. Um, all right, well, let's, let's start with Michael's um, very astute questions, I think. Um, firstly, Rene, specifically for you, how on earth, I'm adding the words on earth, how did you keep going through the years? Your resilience is exemplary. What kept, what kept you going? I, I, there are many others, I'm sure. Uh, what kept us going uh, was, first of all, there are five of us, 
five. I have one brother here and three French cousins, and we are a close family. What kept us going was of the five of us, there is Claire. So four boys, one girl, and she's the junior, whom we, when we were all children taking holidays together in France, we used to have her burst into tears because we threatened to put her in the bottle for the soup stew and, and cook her there. And uh, now we, we regret having said it, but she is the one who has been pushing and pushing this also because of she, her very close, hardworking links with uh, Larry and Ellen in Washington, uh, with Ian here, with Margot, with Emmanuel, with Denise, and with others in Paris. That is, when you think we're not going to get anywhere, another piece of information will surface after, after time. And you think, okay, we are building a case here, and maybe we, it's worth taking a, a punt on it. So, uh, of course, when we lost in the High Court, we thought, that's it. And we've gone to the Court of Appeal. It's not the highest court in France. If, they, if the state and the city of Marseille, on behalf of their museum, had decided to go to the uh, Court de Cassation, which is the French Supreme Court, we'd have dropped out at that stage. It just becomes too expensive, too difficult. But the, the judgment of the appeal court is that it is the state has been at fault. And I think that reminded them that this, you can argue over the nuances of whether or not you can fill in all the dots. The, the balance of evidence is that you, you can't, and the balance of evidence is in our favor, given the paucity of evidence produced by the other side. And I think listening in is at least one school friend of mine uh, who now lives in America has been pursuing his own family restitution for years and years. And we have, ex we've known each other since we were small children and we've exchanged information and uh, he has pursued things and then abandoned it. And sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. And it's always a question of balancing up the evidence and saying, is, is the probability this case? Because there is, no pay, there is no complete paper trail in most cases, as there wasn't in this, but there was a, enough of a paper trail, and that kept us going. Questions, thank you, Lily. The questions are now beginning, as I knew they would eventually, coming in thick and fast. I have one from Helena Cuss, which um, relates to the previous one. Was restitution something that Peter and Charles themselves were interested in their own lifetimes? Um, there was, there was some restitution made, uh, some items were found after the war and were given back. Uh, René Gamper, just before the war, had moved a whole consignment of old masters to a lock-up garage in Paddington. And when Paddington station was completely ruined, the lock-up garage remained. And there is from 1946, 45, 46, an article in the evening news that we used to be there with the Evening Standard showing my father in the lockup garage taking out a soutine and other things uh, that was that survived and that helped to start the gallery. So some things came back. Uh, one, some people in France hid things for us like Odile's family. Others would, there was a uh, medieval sculptures were buried in a garden. They were buried under earth so they could be brought out again. But after the war, that generation, and we know from our parents' generation, they wanted to forget. And basically, they wanted to start a new life. They'd survived it. They'd seen the horrors. And there are enough people here who will have known some real horrors. Mm -hmm. They want to start again. And just the other day, Claire told me that Jean, who's instrumental in, in making sure that so many of the archives survived, she believes he knew about the Dorans, and maybe Peter did too, and they decided we're not going to go after this. So why we as our generation decided to do it, or the last generation that will, and if there isn't any evidence now, uh, there will never be. And there's up to a thousand items still missing. You forget about it. You just got to forget about it, because what's the point of fussing over it? If we know that, and I know from the conference in LA, organized by one of the auction houses, that 
this figure came out, there were, I don't know, I don't know 70 or 80 train loads of artworks, objets d'art, precious objects removed from France alone by the Nazis in the four years of occupation. How many train loads did they remove from every country they occupied? Who knows? All, nearly all of that will be unrecoverable. There is a question relating directly to that, if I could just um, scroll up to find it. Well, actually, one, yes, one that came from Michael himself. How many paintings in the Louvre are under consideration for dubious provenance? But of course, that becomes a much broader question you know, across the world. Have we any sense of how many works are now subject to scrutiny? 16. Now, that comes about from a sale during the war from a, a, an Aryanized collection, so stolen from the Jewish owners. That was sold in 1942. In fact, uh, Ian makes a note of that in one of his charts. That was uh, stolen. And one of, the the, one of the key buyers for the Louvre and for the Musée d'Orsay, for the museum in Troyes eventually, one of the key buyers there is the Louvre's director during the war. So he buys for the Louvre. Now, Corinne Hershkovich, the legal side, and Emmanuel Polak, working to prod her own government are investigating this and I think the family of the descendants of this family it, I am speaking on what I imagine is going to happen are now going to press for restitution now there, there are probably other works too again this is an area it's this this the, the art historians I mentioned plus Claire have set up an organization which is going to sponsor research into provenance in France. And there's going to be a conference in Paris, Nanterre, the university in November. And now the whole, let's say there's been a tilt in French museum practice, provenance is going to become incredibly important. You just have to be careful. We know the auction houses now take an enormous amount of Sotheby's, Christie's, Phillips, they take an enormous amount of care if there's a slightest doubt of something, and it's now time to expand this. But having said that, at a conference in Los Angeles, I just want to let everybody know, one of the speakers said about an unnamed museum in America that they burnt their archives relating to work of art rather than allow researchers to get hold of it. I think you should name and shame it. Tell us which museum it was, Rene. I'm sure you I don't know. It. The you person know. who told us <laughs> wouldn't say. Or maybe they did say, and I didn't know, Jenna. I really don't, Monica, I don't. <laughs> and All right. Um, fine. There's some questions relating to the family story, but let's stick with the issue of restitution um, for the moment. There's a question here from Lauren Fabian. It's quite specific. Which museums, museum, she thinks, museums, were the Derains actually held by? We know, I think it... Okay, they, they were held by the museum in Troyes, two of them, and one at the Musée Cantigny in Marseille. Both museums acquired them after the war. And the museum in Troyes were, had a fantastic donation of Dorin's from a great collector of Dorin called David Lévy. Okay, David Lévy. And he was, so he was a, a Jewish uh, industrialist, French Jewish industrialist in the region of Troyes who built up a great collection, which a lot of which was donated to the museum after the war. He survived the war. He was well liked in the area and he was hidden. We know how, how the French hid as they hid my English grandmother when life got too tricky for her in France. Once Mussolini would been slept to swept aside and the Germans moved and took over the whole of the Côte, Côte d'Azur, it was right, that's it, we pack up all the Jews. So she was moved to and hidden by a French family as tens of thousands of people were in France, as we know, France has an honorable record in that respect. So David, go back to David Levy, who was also protected. He, he donated this remarkable collection. He is in no way involved in the wartime period. He acquired these works in the early 50s. He is not involved. I've met his son, a charming man. There is, you, and there is a way. The museum in Marseille acquired these works in the 1980s, and there's no way. There's no way they could have known, and there's no way they could have known because provenance research was not an issue, shall we say. 
That brings me to a, a question that's both tied in with that, but also I think quite a personal one. Various people in, in the chat here have commented on your apparent, which I say, benevolent toleration, really, or tolerance towards the French, the French government more specifically. And what you haven't touched on, of course, is the complicity of many French people in the war. You, you take a perhaps surprisingly benign view, both of France as a country and of the French government in particular in all this? <laughs> Uh, I go back to what I said earlier, the UK was never occupied, mm. with the exception of the Channel Islands, where families still feel bitter about who collaborated and who betrayed and who resisted. There is still bitterness uh, in amongst the descendants. In the village in Provence, where my brother and my three French cousins and our children share holiday home, in the Vaucluse, a village in the Vaucluse, we... The, we know that some people in the village benefited from the German occupation, others lost heavily. And after the war, what did they do, these villagers in this very poor village at the time? They lived side by side, because that's why you do. There's one English film, the only war film I accept as a true war film, called It Happened Here, by An Andrew Molo, uh, Kevin Brownlow, and it's about the uh, supposed German occupation of England and it raises all the issues of collaboration so much so that United Artists initially didn't, this from 1961, 62, they didn't want to distribute it because there are excellent reasons given for collaboration. When there's no social security, when the only jobs are, you're going to work for the enemy if you're going to work, you accept the situation. That is what France lived through. It lived a misery, it was miserable. At the, by the time of the liberation, most of France was almost starving. And I do have French family. And I, what is the point of being angry now? Virtually everyone from that period is dead. The fact that it, it's still, they're still trying to wind it up is not unique to France. The Germans have lent over backwards to be good. We know that. Not every country has. The UK never had to face this. So... Why am I going to get angry? We've, I, I, I can't speak for my French cousins. They might have a different point of view. And I know that Claire, um, there was a, she was filmed by French terrestrial TV marching into the museum in Troyes a year and a half ago, saying these paintings are ours and having an argument with the director there. But that's, that's theatrics. That's theatrics. I mean, it's true, but it's, it's one of those things. It, 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 these things happen in wartime. What are we to do now? We've, we're getting them back and encourage other people to do their research. You, you can't be bitter any longer. No, that refraining from judgment, I think that's an absolutely essential point, isn't it? I think for all of us to, to bear in mind. Um, indeed, thank you. Um, a very personal sort of family question here from Caroline. I don't know her surname. Could you please explain a bit more about the end of René's life and indeed what happened to Flo Flo uh, Florence, to Flory? Okay, so uh, René was recaptured in the Charol area, which was an area which SOE used for a lot of its drops. So uh, he had been moving there and we think uh, involved in, in another network, but we don't have any record of that for the moment. He was then betrayed and captured by the Nazis. He was put into the uh, sinister Montluc prison in Lyon initially, where Klaus Barbie had imprisoned uh, Jean Moulin. And then he was sent by train to Compiègne and six weeks before the liberation of Paris, as the Allies were already moving across France, he was sent out in one of the last con convoys to Neuengam. From the train, he wrote a message on a long, thin sheet of paper, which he pinpricked with a pin to, to let his nephew, Serge, know, who was in, still in Paris, if this letter would get to him. He put it in a tiny envelope to, to, let, this, to let him know that he was being taken uh, to Compiègne and then on to Germany. And he threw it out of the train, as people did. And it made its way to Serge. I found that out two or three days ago. I also found out it's in the Imperial War Museum, which I had no idea. And Florence? And Florence. In Florence? In Florence. After the war, she came back and lived in England, uh, and she remained bitter. 
she could never quite get over the experience of having lived through this. And she, she rebuilt her life here. She remained a widow. We loved going to see Granny. We found her slightly eccentric because she had very Victorian views on everything. She was adorable. And of course, we were too young. She died in 1980, died in 1980, I think, uh, around that time. She was in her late, late uh, 80s, early 90s. She never spoke about her role in the war. She never spoke about her link to MI6, her work on Azure Transport, her support of her husband, why they didn't go to the UK. She didn't speak about it because we never asked. Just as my father, for instance, who had in Auschwitz, he was, he was tattooed his number. Uh, some of you may know, many of you may know, it's only in Auschwitz that they put a tattooed number on an inmate. So he had a tattooed number on his arm, which he never removed. On the other hand, he never wore short sleeves, even in the hottest summers. He just didn't want to talk about it. He would answer questions, but very few and change the conversation. He just wanted to forget. So he was, he came and he settled here, Peter settled here. Maybe they thought it was easier to start business here. I think Kay, my mother would have preferred to return to Paris. She adored Paris. She'd been there as a young woman, sent over from Manitoba University with a scholarship. Uh, only started working to, to, to Paris in the late thirties. Only started to work at the English embassy to earn, at British embassy to earn some money, pocket money, because her bourse wasn't very much. And after she was in the UK, that's it, came involved in the gallery. So, Florence returned here and lived out her life here. I, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, go on. Because oh, I'm fascinated by your mother, by Kay. Uh, how, how did she rise through the ranks so quickly? I mean, it was an advantage that she was a fluent French speaker, but how did she rise through the ranks uh, from day one to become commander, sending so many um, SOE special forces to France and, I mean, controlling the whole operation. How did that happen? And did it show in later life that she was it, it showed um, in so later commanding? Life. She marshaled everybody. She was <laughs> tiny, but she marshaled everybody. And um, she had a phenomenal memory so that, for instance, in the gallery, some client might wander in who, say, an, say an American client, because the early days, uh, like most of the London art market, we depended a lot on American collectors. So, she, so a collector would wander in who hadn't been in the gallery for two or three years, and she'd go up to him and say, how is your dog doing? The last time you were here, your dog wasn't feeling very well. And has your daughter completed university at such and such a university? And the, the rest of the family would be like, what? Who is this guy? How does she know? It? So I think it's that kind of, that ability to coordinate and to memorize and uh, the, the, uh, the director of the Alliance Francaise, Dr. Hugues, Christelle Hugues, who is from a military family and is writing a story of the SOE in the Alliance Francaise. Uh, she, she managed to get some information about Kay's activities too and I, out of, um, the Kew Gardens where everything is stored, the ones where Kay signs off on a consignment of um, dynamite and a consignment of Sten guns and so on for a particular mission. And then uh, Nigel Atkins is writing about his father and this has a chapter on my father and has come across a lot of information that I didn't know. And one of the saddest things is that when my father was parachuted with Andre Bouloche, his community. They were, they were number one and two in the Paris region, sent over by de Gaulle to pull it all together. And within six weeks, they'd been betrayed by a Sorbonne student who was supposed to be part of the network and who'd cracked under torture. They were supposed to hold out for 24 hours and he hadn't. And so they were arrested suddenly. Uh, and the Sorbonne student asked the Germans to spare him, he was sent to camp and died there. So it's, we know about the women who were parachuted in for SOE and the remarkable stories they had. I have to say that there is one, I'm not going to give the name here, but my mother did tell me about one senior figure at SOE that others will say 
who she said was a complete idiot and did not understand about running agents and inadvertently allowed them to be captured and entire networks to be dismantled. That's someone in London, but it's not for me to say. Thanks. I <laughs> And how are we doing for time? I think it's a few few minutes more. There's um, a very specific question from somebody called Henri, presumably from France. Um, is it possible to talk a little bit about the transfer, the physical transfer of works of art at the end of the war, the arrival of works in such countries as Brazil and Latin America? My, I, I don't know a great deal about that, other than to say that at the end of the war, uh, we know from the Monuments Men that they discovered uh, how much had been stored away uh, by the Nazis in, in various caves and locations. And as it emerged, just it was a discovery by the Allies as they discovered the concentration camps, which was the, the major discovery in the sense of bringing it to public attention. So they, it's finally dawned on them that there was a huge amount, a huge amount in hundreds of thousands, millions of artworks of every kind, obviously they are precious, stolen and stored and stashed everywhere. And so began a process of trying to trace the owners. Fairly easy in the case of a state collection. And of course, there's this remarkable woman in Paris who was at the Louvre and who made a note that uh, she was very quiet. And as the Germans brought things into the Jeu de Baume to be sent off from all over French collections, she was just scribbling away and they paid no attention to her until towards the end they began to suspect. And she was making a note of exactly what was going where. And they were stamping the back of, of canvases and they were stamping boxes. This is, this, is, this is a work by such and such an old master and it's going to there. Because they thought it was, the Reich was going to live forever. So they didn't care. And she made a note of it. Yes, I think we should name her, Renly. I was also racking my brains. I know exactly who you're talking about, but somebody called Carol has very kindly come to the rescue. Her name is Rose Vallon. And Rose Vallon. All credit, That's all credit to her. Remarkable, yes. remarkable, brave, brave. Decorated woman. very lately, very late, but absolutely wonderful character, yes. So I think we need to bring start bringing things to a close. Um, there's a, a specific question, perhaps a more general one, we can sort of ask to. Uh, together. Um, are there more lawsuits in the pipeline? Is your family planning to take further action on any fronts? Uh, I don't know. There's nothing that we are pursuing at the moment. Um, okay. And then tied in with that perhaps is, do you have I, any words of wisdom, words of advice for any other family? My, oh yes, very much advice? so. Mm -hmm. you, you have to give it an, an incredible amount of time and gather as much evidence as you can. And when you think you've got enough evidence, you haven't. You've got to continue searching and you have to you make use of the experts. You know, you have to use the cross-referencing. There are a number of agencies now in European and maybe in America to European countries that will assist where they can. And uh, they are, they've opened up the files. Uh, You've, you, you've just got to keep looking and looking and digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And after all, this, as I said, took almost a decade of research and it's just concluded about a few weeks ago. Um, if we have to go into something else, it's a big task. Uh, so any family doing it, be prepared to do uh, to engage time and expense on a huge task of research, unless you have it bona fide evidence, which I don't believe exists anymore. It would already have been presented. I mean, concrete paper trail from collection to theft. Indeed, thank you. Um, going back to Rose Vallon, somebody called Clara Casson has just mentioned a book which we all ought to know about, and I don't know, it sounds as though it's only in French at the moment, about Vallon's story called Le Front de l'Art, so that's worth knowing about. Um, I think it is nearly half past. Um, let me ask you one last question. I'm sorry if I haven't had time to go through all the many questions that have been coming in, but hold on, let's just see. Yes, actually, lots of thank yous, as you can imagine. But let me just end with one question, which in fact, several people have put in one form or another. You couldn't make this story up. It, 
you know, <laughs> as Sue said at the very beginning, is a film company onto it, to put it very crudely? And I know the answer is yes, but perhaps, Renny, you can tell us a little bit more. Oh, uh, well, there's, there may be a documentary made on it for television. Uh, that's That's been a proposal, um, a documentary, yes, it's, it's proposed for, uh, by, by, a, by a, a firm that's, a, firm that's a, a company, a production company that specializes in documentaries and they've approached us and we've sort of agreed to it, yes. So, I mean, if I can end on a lighter note, one proposal, is that I go to Paris when the paintings are delivered and they film me with my expression on my face. I say, well, you can use my cousin Claire, who's a wonderful English speaker. And they say, yes, but well, this, is, this is going to be featured on the UK side of things. And uh, I said, yes, but am I going to say to the three pictures, oh, it's so wonderful to see you. I've missed you for 80 years. No, I, I don't know what expression to put on, but it's true, it, would be, it will be moving for complex reasons, because the moving out of a, of a public collection to a private situation is in a country which I love, as well, I just love France. I had a French education too in the UK, and my father was French, and it, these, these are not easy. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's a, a good ending, and it's a necessary ending, it's not as a happier ending. And after all, the principal person, the two principal people, Florence and Rene, are not here to see it. So it's an ending. Thank you, Rene, so very, very much. There are dozens, quite literally dozens of very heartfelt thank yous coming through the chat option. I wish that you know, we could be together in person in a room to see people clapping, et cetera, et cetera. So let's just keep it simple and to the point. Thank you so very, very much indeed. Well, thank you, various, and various and people. Michael, and all those who listened in. Thank you, and for your questions. Okay. At least thank one you. person, hold on, Renny, at least one person has said, I would like to listen to it all over again, which of course is no small compliment. And I will just end, if I may, by saying that yes, the session has been recorded. And like all the events that have taken place under the auspices of the Insiders Outsiders project, it has, uh, it will be in a few days time, hopefully hopefully within a week, be uploaded both in the case of this particular talk onto the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees YouTube channel, and also onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel, which is proving to be quite a rich resource of past events and, you know, for, for posterity. I'd also like to mention, if I may, that there is a rather wonderful short film made by Andrew Snell together with his partner Eileen Hughes, a, an interview with Rene, which forms part of a series called Fractured Worlds, which you can most easily find on the homepage of the Insiders Outsiders Festival website. And just for those of you who don't know it, easy to find online, but it's www insidersoutsidersfestival.org. It's also in the resources section, but um, I think I would recommend that you listen to that when you have a moment. It's not so much or not so specifically about this restitution case, but it actually has Rene talking about the wider uh, activities of the gallery, which as Sue earlier said, is also very much part of the bigger and Im important story. And last but not least, if I may, before we call it a day, I'd like to alert those of you who don't already know that this wonderful session is the very first in a new series of online programs, which uh, uh, online um, events is part of a program that starts today, goes on to the 4th of uh, November, a very diverse and varied and rich uh, terrain that's being covered. So if you're at all interested and you don't already know about the program, again, go to the Insiders Outsiders website and check it out. So I will say goodbye now. Thank you very much to all of you who have attended in your very large numbers, again, to Rene, to Sue, to the AJR. And I hope to see many of you on subsequent occasions. A very Thank good you. night to you all. Thank good you. Night. Good night.